Good morning and welcome to the first session on chapter 10, Determination of Income and Employment. This is a very interesting chapter because we are going to determine how income and employment forms a very important, rather a crucial part of the economy. So moving forward, let us see what we are going to learn today in this chapter. So the introduction, we're going to start with consumption, very important function of the economy. Without consumption, there's not much of thing happening in macroeconomics. Next, we move to the consumption function. We're going to understand it from an economic perspective using a little bit of equations. Then we're going to talk about marginal propensity to consume. This is also an important topic. We are going to learn it for the first time, a very important concept in macroeconomics. We're also going to talk about average propensity to save. That's also an important factor that we are going to learn today in this session. So not wasting much of your time, let's move forward and let's try to understand what is this consumption altogether. Now, introduction to this topic starts with these three important concepts that we need to start understanding is aggregate demand. The word aggregate demand itself is a very, very important word that starts coming in macroeconomics. Where is that word aggregate demand? What is the real meaning of it? Now, we all know about demand. Demand as a function, demand as a law, demand as a concept in economics. But what is aggregate demand? If you look at the word aggregate demand, it is the overall demand that is being created in an economy. So it's a sum of all factors put together. That's where the aggregate demand starts. It builds up as a function, starts moving up and creates a wholesome personality altogether. So the word aggregate itself is a collection, is a sum total that we are going to talk about. So aggregate demand is a very, very important function that starts getting a cumulative effect in the economy and starts moving forward. Next, we are going to talk about ex ante and ex post. Ex ante is what has been planned and ex post is what has been done. Now, when we talk about this economics, we already know that there are certain functions like savings, consumptions, income, all those factors that comes in. So, ex ante is what has been decided in terms that we want to do it and expose after that what happens, what has actually happened. Most of the time in the economy, we always plan, we decide that this is how much we need to save, this is how much we want to do in our life, these are the targets that we have kept in our mind. But then we come and realize at some stage that this is what we have actually done. So the ex ante and ex post form a very crucial part in everybody's life. We try to understand this, especially when it comes to the savings standpoint. Now moving forward. Consumption. What is consumption? Consumption is defined as a function that relationship between consumption and income. So this is where we are going to define, we are going to understand the consumption factor altogether. How can you consume something? Physically, consumption is something that what you intake, that what you observe yourself. But in economics, consumption is something that can happen only based on the income. So we say that consumption is a function that is related to income. Only when you have an income, then you can have a consumption factor. So is it that every time should I have an income? The next question in the mind. What if I'm not earning, but still I am consuming? So now the question that comes back in macroeconomics is that if I don't have an income, can I still go ahead and consume? The answer to that is definitely and yes. Why? Because we say that as autonomous consumption independent of income. Now, if you look into a family, the father is the earning member. But the child, the kid is not an earning member. The kid will be dependent on father. So the kid automatically will consume the food, automatically will consume to his needs and wants. He is independent of the income. He actually does not know what his father is earning, how much is earning, what kind of function does he do. But then he is also a part of the consumption cycle. So in our regular life, 
in spite of income coming in or not there are certain matters there are certain functions there are certain activities which we need to do on a daily basis those are independent of the income so they are called as the autonomous function altogether so we use the word autonomous consumption which means to say that automatically it has to happen it is inbuilt that cannot be separated that cannot be taken out of you so it is an inbuilt function of you so we call it as autonomous consumption it is completely devoid of your income at any given point of time now moving forward we are going to look into the consumption function altogether. Now, how do you define the consumption function altogether? You need to understand this equation. C is equal to C plus CY. Let me just redefine this equation. I'm going to put it as C is equal to C dash plus C into Y. Now, C is the consumption, which is independent now if i'm going to look here this is the consumption function which is dependent on the income factor y now c dash is the autonomous induction so i would use the word c dash here where i say that is the consumption which is independent of income the c dash is the autonomous consumption which is independent of income it is going to happen automatically whether you are there or not whether you are earning or not it is going to be an independent factor of the income now cy will show the dependence factor now this is a dependence factor this consumption the small c is dependent on the income y in economics we will indicate income using the letter y in economics we will indicate the factor consumption using the letter C and autonomous consumption is indicated using the letter C dash so automatically when you start seeing this equation consumption is equal to autonomous consumption plus dependent consumption that is on your income so there are two factors one which you are dependent on your income you need money for that that might be about a payment of services that might be about some sort of factors which where money is needed if you want that service you have to pay for it there are some other factors which you might not need money for it you might get it from others or you are a part of the circle you are automatically benefited so what i mean to say here is that consumption is a function of autonomous plus dependency factor one more time let me just repeat it here c stands for consumption y stands for income that is very very important here and the word c dash is the autonomous consumption altogether now moving forward marginal propensity to consume now this i want you to have a look into the image altogether the picture here how much do we consume on a daily basis is this something related to your calories is this something related to your intake no this is something which is related from an economic standpoint where i'm going to ask you this question how much do you really consume which means how much do you buy how much do you apply to yourself how much do you intake in terms of your buying in terms of your spending altogether to answer to that question we need to understand the marginal propensity to consume what is this marginal propensity to consume how does that ever happen altogether it is the marginal propensity to consume it is a change in consumption per unit change in income a very interesting factor altogether i am now going to write down a small formula for you to make this things simpler and even more interesting now the marginal propensity to consume mpc is given by the formula delta c by delta y so this is the formula that you have to keep in your mind now when i say delta c what is that sir delta c means change in consumption divided by change in income the delta represents the change factor now you know that when your income increases the consumption pattern also increases this is a very very common factor or a common example that you can see in any country especially in india 
let's say for an example that you have joined a job recently and your salary is 20,000 rupees a month. So for that 20,000 rupees, you would have planned in your mind what I need to buy, what kind of lifestyle I need to live. So in that 20,000 rupees, you would have decided about your expenditure, about your savings, about your investment and your regular walk of life. But then suddenly you get a good news saying that your salary has been doubled, which means from the next month onwards, your salary moves to 40,000 rupees a month automatically now there is a change in income that is happening moment there is a change in income you will again start looking into the propensity of consumption which means you want to consume more i have more money with me i can spend more i can enjoy more i can go more for shopping which means my propensity to consume increases marginally it is not going to increase overnight it is going to have a small effect it's going to have a step-by-step -step effect it is going to propel up one by one so which means because of increase in income my increase in expenditure is also going up it's going northwards right now so that's where i'm going to see change in consumption for change in unit income so it is showing me an increase factor altogether it is denoted by delta c by delta y i want you to remember this formula because this is an important concept in the exam standpoint also so this is very very important for us the delta c by delta y so that is what we mean by change in terms of the consumption to the change in income this word marginal because it is not going to happen all of a sudden it's going to happen in a step-by-step -step manner altogether so moving forward average propensity to save now this word savings itself is very very important again if you look into the image this is one thing that we have learned right from our childhood putting money into the piggy bank that's how we learned savings in our life every time when you look into that piggy bank you would be very happy to see the amount of money that gets collected the jingling noise of the coins makes really happy and makes a pleasant noise to your ears why because savings is something which is very very important concept that you start learning by yourself in a practical mode so what is this average propensity to save average propensity to save it is the savings per unit of income and it is denoted by s divided by y so now we are going to learn a new term called s which means savings divided by y which means income so let's try to understand savings and income as a concept altogether now let's say let's go back to the example of your earnings you are earning 40000 rupees a month how much do you want to save now 40000 rupees is the income y stands for 40000 rupees and now you want to save 50% of the income so s stands for saving which is equal to 20000 rupees which means 50% of your income you want to save now that shows the average propensity because now you have decided that 50% of my monthly income I will save every month. This is not a target but this is a word of caution. This is a word of precaution that you have taken in your mind saying that every month I will save 50% of my money. So which means to say that you have started creating an average in your mind. So at the end of one year you should have about 2 lakh 40 thousand rupees saved which means 20 thousand rupees a month so you would have saved 2 lakh 40 thousand rupees into 12 months now this is an average it is not a single day effort it's a cumulative effect 20 thousand rupees a month and you are going to save it for one year and you are going to get a magic figure here called as 2 lakh 40 thousand rupees so now what is happening you are getting propelled to save you are getting the intensity in your mind. You are getting that flow in your mind that every month I will save 20,000 rupees and start moving up the ladder. This is possible only when your income is at a particular level. Only when your income is at 40,000 rupees, you can save 20,000 rupees. Now, if I'm going to reverse the story for a while, if I'm going to say that your salary itself is 20,000 rupees, will you be able to save that entire savings 
will you be make it to entire 20,000? Definitely not. Because at that time, what will happen here is that you need some money for your expenditure. You need some money for your survival. Then only you will be able to save it. So that is why we say that we will be able to save only that much. We will not be able to do the savings 100% on the income. Based on the income, you will be able to do the savings. So that is why we call it as average propensity to save altogether. With that, we move to the next slide. Coming to the conclusion for today's session, this is the most important concept in terms of understanding your income level altogether. Why? Because in this chapter, when you try to understand those words called as consumption and investment and income altogether, these are all the basic level factors that will determine your income at a macroeconomic level. Saying so, I would like to conclude the session by making the session as interactive, interesting and educative as far as possible. Thank you for joining me on this wonderful session. I hope and believe this session will make a lot of sense and a lot of meaning to you from a macroeconomic standpoint. Thank you once again.